So who would be the most um, preeminent scientist or scientists in China with respect to viruses? There's a, there's a pretty interesting character who leads the charge there, correct? She even has her own nickname. <laughs> she does. And, you know, it's, it's one of these stories where as a journalist, you feel like you can't even make this stuff up, right? I, Shi Zheng Li is the lead coronavirus researcher, the foremost coronavirus researcher in China. She is a sort of a nationally revered, very well-known figure. Um, so she is the lead coronavirus researcher at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, and she has this nickname, Batwoman. Um, and that comes from her fearless exploration of these bat caves in southern China. So, you know, when you see her image, she's often shown wearing this spacesuit uh, in the BSL-4 lab at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, and she's, you know, she's like among these sort of sparkling firmament of internationally renowned scientists. She's, nobody disputes that she's earned her place there. Um, and she's particularly well known for a key discovery from the SARS-CoV-1 outbreak, which is she was the first researcher to figure out the mechanism by which um, humans were infected by that virus, which is through the ACE2 receptors, human lung cells. Um, so she identified the mechanism for transmission. Now, how long has the uh, Institute been doing gain of function research? And maybe even before we answer that question, we could take a moment to explain what gain of function is. It's actually not perfectly, um, uh, there, there, isn't a, there isn't an exceptional definition for it, but, but I think we can loosely describe it. Sure. So, you know, first of all, um, there are, there are um, some people who say that all of virology is gain of function research, which is basically when you study a virus, you are seeing sort of what functions it gains and what functions it loses. You know, how does it infect? Um, is it going to become more infectious? And by what mechanism is it going to become more infectious? So gain of function research, put simply, is this idea that you are trying to um, test whether the pathogen can become more infectious. You're trying to give it attributes that it doesn't possess in nature as a way to gauge its infectiousness to humans. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, look at the surface. I think if you're listening to this and you don't dabble in this world, that sounds a bit absurd, right? We're gonna take a virus that may have a certain level of either virulence or lethality um, or transmissibility, you know, some feature that makes a virus undesirable and we're going to enhance that. So <clears throat> what's the argument for doing that? What's the argument for making a bad virus worse or making a good virus bad? So, you know, first of all, let me say this is hugely controversial and has sort of divided the field of virology um, because there are people who say this is absolutely crazy. You know, as one source said to me, it's like, it's like looking for a gas leak with a lighted match. And there are other people who say this is absolutely essential. So the argument for why to do it is that um, in order to gauge the risk um, from viruses that exist in nature, you have to experiment with how they become infectious to humans. And one of the ways to do that is essentially to soup up that virus. You know, you can, um, through genetic uh, editing, you can make it more infectious and see if it is, you know, one of these things that it's, it's a determination of where we should put our resources. You know, what do we need to protect against? Um, there are other people who say, all right, we're going to these very remote areas where these viruses are tucked inside these caves. 
We're taking back samples to laboratories in crowded urban areas. We are then altering these pathogens to make them more infectious, right? That is, as one person said to me, the definition of insanity. Is there any evidence that gain of function research has produced victories in the past? And we can even just keep, you know, SARS-CoV-2 um, off the off the list at the moment because I don't think there's any evidence it's benefited our fight against this virus. But is there any evidence it has aided with the creation of flu vaccines or other vaccines? Right. So, so the people who defend it say that you actually do need to do this kind of research in order to um, help with vaccine development, that this is the way that you figure out how to create resistance is to look at, to experiment with how viruses might mutate. So that, for example, if you wanted to, you know, kind of forecast what the variants of SARS-CoV-2 would be, like as I'm sure the audience has heard of, you know, the fearsome Delta variant, which is so afflicting many countries in the world and now increasingly our own, um, part of, you know, part of what gain of function research can help do is forecast the mutations. Um, uh, but, I, you know, there are people who say that there is a lot of other ways to do this kind of research without running the risk of unleash, unleashing, um, you know, deadly pathogens that you can't control once they're out in the world. Now, what's the U.S. government's position been on gain of function research? Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, when I started, let me just say, as a journalist um, and as an investigative journalist, I had been reporting on the pandemic for a year. And once I got into this question that you just asked, I was like, wow, I can't believe how controversial and yet how under the radar this whole question has been. So... Um, just to back up, in 2011, a scientist named Ron Fauchier um, did gain-of-function research with the H1N1 virus and um, created uh, a, a, um, a pathogen that he said was the most dangerous and infectious the world has ever known uh, through manipulations. So that sparked this outcry in the scientific community um, a group called the Cambridge Working Group was formed, which was basically stood in opposition to this kind of research. And their expressions of concern led the U.S. government to impose a moratorium on any kind of uh, gain, funding of any kind of gain of function research of SARS and MERS pathogens. Um, so then began a period of review, task forces, reports, um, analysis. And interestingly, in the very beginning of the Trump administration in, in January of 2017, that moratorium was lifted. Um, but it was replaced with this framework, which had pretty much enough, you know, loopholes to drive a truck through. But it basically said, any agency in the U.S. government that wants to fund this kind of research needs to have its own review process in place and needs to ensure that the entities that are getting U.S. taxpayer dollars are proceeding safely. I know that one of the one of the things that has has allowed people to sort of lose faith in the government has been statements that both Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci have made with respect to this when asked. Uh, both of them have been asked if the United States government or specifically NIH has funded uh, gain of function research. Both have emphatically denied it. I, I believe uh, the direct quote uh, from Francis Collins, neither NIH nor NIAID have ever approved any grant that would have supported gain of function research on coronaviruses that would have increased their transmissibility or lethality for humans. Um, also in May of 2021, Anthony Fauci told the Senate hearing that 
NIH and NIAID categorically have not funded gain of function research to be conducted at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Can you evaluate the veracity of those statements? So here is where we enter this true semantic marshland um, because the, the feeling of, and I'm not talking about sort of wing nuts who want to fire Fauci, credible people who have evaluated this say that there is some sort of rhetorical uh, gray area here. Um, uh, first of all, while they haven't funded research, uh, while the government hasn't funded research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology directly, they have funded uh, basically an intermediary nonprofit called EcoHealth Alliance, which in turn has given subgrants to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So, yeah, no direct funding, but yeah, indirect funding. Now, Part of the obligation of EcoHealth Alliance was to report back to the NIH and say, you know, here's our progress reports. Here is, you know, what the Wuhan Institute of Virology was doing with some of the, your grant money. And we ensure that they've been doing this safely. We don't know what's in those progress reports because NIH has not released them. That, that um, smells like a FOA waiting to happen. Oh, I'm the NIH now is like being buried up to their eyeballs in FOIAs. Absolutely. You know, people want to know what did they know about this research? Um, you know, there, there are numerous investigations ongoing into that very question right now, including from the HHS inspector general. So there, there's a lot of questions around this and not, you know, and, and let me just say um, part of the reporting effort for me was um, disentangling conspiracy theories. And there's, you know, there are wall-to-wall -wall conspiracy theories out there, um, you know, disentangling the ones that have no basis in reality, and then trying to evaluate the credible questions, right? So in my investigation, there are credible questions, um, you know, about that funding. I mean, why were we giving taxpayer, why were we allowing taxpayer dollars to, you know, a high level Chinese laboratory where we now believe there was actually military scientists working in there? They're obviously an adversary. As, as one person said to me, hey, what, what's wrong with the Louis Pasteur Institute? You know, I mean, maybe we should make more of an effort to restrict our research dollars to uh, the, the science laboratories of, of allies and not adversaries. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit Peter Atia, MD dot com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.